Lecture 7, Module 1, DMAIC, Analyze Stage, Part 2. Analyze the data. In this module, we will look at analyzing the data using graphical analysis, multivar analysis, common causes to special causes, run charts, box plots, and confidence intervals. In Lecture 1, we saw that Six Sigma can be seen as an implementation of the scientific method. In Define, we take a practical problem and in Measure, make it into a statistical problem. In Analyze, we develop a statistical solution, and in Improvement Control, transform it into a practical solution. In the Analyze phase, we will take the data we obtained in the Measure phase and, starting with a visual, graphical analysis, move on to a statistical analysis of the data. Process Analysis and Data Analysis As stated in Lecture 6, the Analyze phase has two distinct parts to it. Analysis of the process that was being measured, previously covered in Lecture 6, and analysis of data that was measured, which we cover here in Lecture 7. Data Analysis This second stage of analysis concerns the data. The data is examined visually, graphically, for clues to what may be wrong, and also to possibly identify causes. The main tools are graphical analysis and multivar analysis. The second stage of analysis starts with the graphical analysis and is then coupled with the statistical analysis using things such as distribution identification, run chart analysis, and SPC, hypothesis testing, t-test, f-test, chi-squares, etc., correlation, and regression analysis. In the graphical analysis of data, we look at what do distributions look like, histograms, dot plots, graphical summaries, and then bring that over to statistical analysis of the data, which data model fits the best, normality and distribution ID testing. We look at are there changes over time, starting with a time series plot, and move to a statistical analysis that tells us whether the changes are significant from using the run charts. We look at data or distributions being the same using box plots, individual value plots, and then statistical analysis of the data using confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, etc., to see if the distributions are the same. We also look for relationships using scatter plots and matrix plots, and then our statistical analysis looks at how strong these relationships are using correlation, regression, fitted line plots, and multiple regression. Now Minitab offers a lot of graphical analysis, and from the graph option in Minitab's menu bar, you can pick a lot of them. The upper quadrant is used for correlation, scatter plot, matrix plot, marginal plots. The second one is used for plotting distributions, histograms, dot plots, stem and leaf, probability plots, empirical uh, cumulative uh, distribution functions, and probability distribution plots. The next one is used for comparing groups of data with box, box plots, interval plots, individual value plots, and line plots. And then we use uh, the next portion for analyzing categories of data, so bar charts and pie charts and then looking for trends over time, time series plots, area graphs, and then finally the 3D uh, using three variables, so contour plots, 3D scatter plots, and 3D surface plots. Now although this course will only review the most commonly used graphs, you're, you're strongly encouraged to explore these other options and get a feel for what uh, Minitab can do for you. So we ask the questions, what do distributions look like? There are three quick ways to get a look at our data distributions. First is a histogram, and we looked at histograms of our first pass analysis back in the measure phase. We also have the dot plots. These are plots very similar to histograms, only they use dots to represent each data point instead of the bins uh, that the histogram uses to represent the ranges of data. And then the graphical summaries. These are a nice all-in-one feature of Minitab that combines several graphical outputs and their corresponding descriptive statistics all on one graph. Histograms. These are probably the most common and best known graphs used in Six Sigma and elsewhere. They give a good overview of the behavior of the data or the process. As discussed before, histograms display your data in bins, and each bin may hold many data points from different, many different places in your data. Minitab does not automatically update graphs as, uh, as Excel does. So if you make changes to your data, you must update your graph manually. A green X in the upper left-hand corner means the graph is current. 
If you see a yellow symbol, that means the graph is not current. You can right-click that symbol and then select Update Graph Now, and that will update the, the graph uh, to uh, reflect any changes you've made to your data. If for some sad reason you have a white X there, that means the graph is not current and it cannot be updated. Uh, so you will have to recreate the graph uh, from any changes you made to your data. And dot plots. These look very similar to histograms, but with smaller data sets, uh, each dot can re represent only one data point. So you'll see each individual data point. Uh, the dot plots will look similar to a histogram of, uh, of the same data, but they're not ex not really identical. Now note with very large data sets, Minitab may include more than one data point uh, in each dot, and you will not know uh, the exact values of them. One of the cool functions of the dot plots is they can be interrogated to reveal the location of a data point that you may be interested in. In the dot plot at right, we may be interested in the single point li lying out at, uh, at point 128. Brushing it will reveal information about it. How do we do that? We click the brush tool <coughs> button and brush the area around the dot uh, you are interested, just much, much like you would crop an area. And the value and lower location of the dot will be shown. So here we see that dot is the actual value is 128.229 and it's in row 330 of our data. Especially with large data points, large data sets, it's, it's great to be able to find where that data is. Now note, if there's more than one data point in each dot, and that can happen when there's large data sets, the brush tool cannot be used, and the tool will be grayed out and you will not, you will not be able to, to brush the area. And that's an indication that there's too much data uh, being held in the, dot, in the dot plot. Graphical summaries. These plots combine the graphical information of a histogram, a box and whisker plot, and the confidence interval plot, and the descriptive statistics that Minitab generates for all these three plots. The graphical summary can quickly tell a story about your data or process. So the histogram uh, is, is displayed uh, along with its normality test, and the results of the Anderson Darling show a p-value greater than 0 0.05, 0 0.9, 0 0.885, rather, indicating very normally distributed data, and the descriptive statistics, the mean, standard deviation, along with the variance, skewness, and kurtosis, and, and the number of data points are shown. The box and whisker plot uh, is also shown, and this shows the shape, dispersion, and the center of your data by showing the quartiles of, e of your data, and also po points out any potential outliers. Now note, the scale is the exact same scale as used in the histogram. So the mean, a point, the median point, and the mean point should line up, and all the data points should line up. The, the descriptive statistics give you the minimum and maximum values, the first and third quartiles, and the median shown here. Now the box and whisker plot may seem primitive, but it's a great tool to quickly visualize your data. Its correspondence to the, data, to the histogram are shown in the, in the, in the graph list, uh, to the right. The box actually represents the center 50% of the data, from the first quartile, quartile to the third quartile. The line in the middle is the median. The whiskers mark the range of the data from the minimum to the maximum value but they won't extend past 1, 1 1.8, 1.5 times the interquartile range, the IQR. Now any data that's beyond that are considered to be outliers and their position are marked as an asterisk. So actually the, the box and whisker can point out data that may be considered a, a, an outlier uh, where the histogram does not. You'll have to just visually see that. Also the confidence intervals. The confidence interval specifies the range that the mean or the median are estimated to lie with a certain statistical probability, and that can be selected uh, by you. 90, 95%, and 99% are commonly used. Now for a perfectly normal distribution, the mean and the median will line up. Here you see that these, these are not lined up, meaning there is some kind of skewness or non-normality uh, to, uh, to the distribution. And again, the descriptive statistics tell you where the upper and lower values are of the confidence interval. So the confidence interval for the 95% confidence interval for the mean, uh, any, it could be anywhere from 98.979 to 100.724. So which data model fits uh, our data best? We can look at the norm that normality, and we visually inspect histograms and dot plots. Uh, may not be really sufficient to identify your data as normally distributed. And even the more robust graphical summary may not be satisfactory enough. 
So it is always re recommended to perform a normality test to see if your data is normally distributed enough so that you may safely proceed to use normal statistical tests on them. A p-value of greater than 0.05 is acceptable. The p-value here is greater than 0 0.05, 0 0.210, so these data may be treated as normal and the typical tests may be applied to it with confidence. Now the individual distribution ID, if the results of the normality test show your data cannot be considered normally distributed, the p-value is less than 0 0.05, then an indiv individual distribution ID may add insight into the very nature of your data. Minitab can apply your data against 14 common distributions, including a Johnson or a Box-Cox transformation of the data. Uh, even this exercise may be equivocal, emphasizing that you must understand the origin of your data. So you, what, you, what that means is you may see more than one uh, uh, distribution match up fairly nicely to your data. So which one is it? If you know the origin of your data, whether it's reliability data, time data, things like that, that can help eliminate uh, uh, one of them and hone you in on the right distribution to use. Now, are there changes over time? In our first pass analysis, we took a first look at our data using simple time series plots to get an idea of what we're working with. Initially, you might, we might believe we saw something that may indicate uh, in this graph like a problem of an upward trend in the data. We need to be able to distinguish between normal behavior data and abnormal data behavior of our data. Just visually looking at it and thinking there's something is there is not enough. So if there's the purest of changes, are they significant? To understand significance of changes, we need to understand two different types of variation. One, common cause variation. This is a variation caused by really unknown factors uh, in the universe that result in a steady but random distribution of output around the average of, of the data is a measure of the process potential actually and or how well the process can perform when there are no special cause variation or, or when, and when, when special cause variation is removed or there's none present. Special cause variation. These are variations that are caused by known or soon to be known uh, factors that result in non-random distribution of output. These are also referred to as exceptional uh, causes, exceptional variation or assignable causes, assignable variation. Special cause variation is a shift in output caused by a specific factor such as an environmental condition or process and parameter being different, and it can be accounted for directly and potentially removed uh, and eliminated, and it is a measure of actual process control. So there are different types of uh, changes, uh, significant changes. One is a shift, and this is a single movement of the process off its target, and it is a sign that something has changed in the process. Trends or drift are slow, continuous movement of the process away from the target, and it's a sign that something ch is changing in the process and is also a warning that the process may soon go out of control. This can be caused by worn parts or parts wear slowly wearing or a piece of equipment not holding its, its settings over time. Oscillation is an alternating upward and downward movement of data during a process indicating it is not steady. Mixtures are seen when there are two processes running and the data appear to be a mix of different data and it's characterized by a lack of data near the center line and may indicate the data came from two different operators, two different shifts, or two different pieces of equipment. Clusters of group of, are groups of data that appear to be hanging out together and not randomly moving with the other data. They can be caused by measurement errors, lot-to-lot -lot variability, or shift different differences in setup of the process. Spikes are data that periodically jump up or down significantly from the rest of the data. And freaks are one-time aberrant data that cannot be assigned to any particular category of behavior and are very, very hard to identify uh, how they occurred. And note, you need to identify what caused these changes before taking any kind of corrective action. If you don't know what caused it, you cannot change it. So how do we know when they're significant? Well, we can use run charts. We can take our data th from our time series plots and analyze them using a run chart. A run in a, in, in a run chart is a series of points running on one side of the median line. For any given number of normally distributed data points, there will be an expected number of runs on each side of the median line. More or less than the expected number may indicate a problem. And here in the boxes uh, below, you see that it says number of runs about median 26, the expected number of runs 26.0. So this data looks like it's behaving the way it would be expected to behave. And the number of runs up or down in the next box 31, expected number of runs 33. 
so that's pretty close. Now run charts can analyze the data for clustering of the data, the presence of mixtures, trends, and oscillation, and each are, are, are calculated with a p-value. Our run chart at right shows us that the number of runs versus the expected runs is about equal, 26, 26, 31, 33, and, this, and the suspected upward trend really is not significant. All right, so the p-value is less than 0.05. So for the trend is 0.247. This is not uh, unexpected. Clustering. In our run chart at right, there appears to be several periods of time where the data remain grouped and is not moving randomly about the median line. The analysis of a run chart shows that suspected clustering is significant. The p-value for clustering is 0 0.011, less than 0.05. trends. We can see in our run chart right there appears to be an upward run of data that on the left half of the chart that could be a trend, most likely. And the analysis of run charts says the, sp the, sp the sp suspected trend is significant. The p-value for the trend is 0 0.02, so it's less than 0 0.05. Mixtures and oscillations. In our run chart we see data that appears to be oscillating up and down across the median. The analysis of our chart shows the suspected oscillation is significant. The p-value for oscillation is 0 0.044, so less than 0 0.05. However, the analysis of our chart also shows that the data is suspected of being a mixture. The p-value for mixtures is 0 0.000. It is necessary to determine which change is actually happening. Multivari charts. These are charts that graphically show variation of equality characteristics for multiple factors. The purpose of the chart is to permit identification of the factor or factors having the greatest effect on the variability. So the chart on the right shows two parts collected hourly from four mold cavities for three hours, consisting of measurements at three locations, beginning, middle, and end uh, on the parts. We can see that the di diameters from cavity one are increasing by location and time in this plot. Minitab can, can display one Y's response and up to four uh, X variables on a chart. Now our data or distribution is the same. The box plot can be used to graphically compare two different sets of data or distributions. Simply looking at a box plot can give you clues to what may be happening. Here we see two sets of data that appear to have different means and medians. The range of the data, standard deviation that is, appears different too, somewhat. And if we look at the histograms, uh, the histograms can be used to graphically compare two data, different, data, the different sets of data or distributions also. Here we see that the two sets of data appear to have different means, but they share a lot of data in common. Could they be basically the same data? Now box plots again, here we see two sets of data that appear to have different standard deviations and possibly means, slightly different. They, see, they appear similar. Here we see two sets of data that appear to have different medians and different standard deviations. But are they really different? Minitab allows you to add additional displays to these box plots. Here we have added the values of the medians, the locations of each data point, and a line connecting the medians. Although these data appear to be different, most of the data share the same value space. There's only a handful of data points that are not, that are not in the same value space. So are they really the same or are they different? Individual value plots. An alternative plot to the box plot is a simple individual value plot. These simply display the data points in a line, uh, but can have similar additions to the line as we saw on the last slide. Here we also see the median point, an interval bar, uh, and a line connecting the medians. One other way of comparing the data. So let's look at interval plots. These plots can help you visualize the relationship between two or more means. Minitab shows the 95% confidence intervals for the means of your data. That means the Minitab, or the, the statistical analysis, is 95% confidence that the mean is, is between those two points. Here we see that the upper confidence uh, uh, interval for batch 5 is lower than the lower confidence interval for batch 6. This seems to clearly indicate that there is a difference between these uh, two batches. The means are definitely not overlapping whatsoever. They are different means. So how different are the data? Confidence intervals. The calculation of a mean is what is called a point estimate. And since it is calculated from a sample of a population, it may not be exactly equal to the true mean of the population, which is theoretically never known. 
We can also calculate a confidence interval, which is an interval estimate, giving us an estimate of the reliability of that data. The confidence interval specifies a range within which the mean is estimated to lie based on the number of samples taken. The confidence interval is calculated shown below from the standard error of the mean and the z-score of the confidence level we're looking for, which is usually 90%, 95 or 99%. The standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of the sample mean estimate of a population mean. It can be simply seen as the standard deviation of the error in the sample mean relative to the true population mean. The formula for the standard error of the mean is, 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 in a sample is standard error of the mean is, is a standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And n is the sample size. Now, the normal distribution, we, we, normal distribution, we're already familiar with the area under the normal curve for each standard deviation or z-score. Here we see that plus or minus one standard deviation is worth 68.3 percent of the of the distribution. Two standard deviations covered 95.4 percent, and three standard deviations covered 99.7 percent. The z-score for 90 percent, 95, and 99 percent of the area, we can find the z-score for any amount of area under the normal distribution. So for the 90 percent uh, dis the distribution, it goes from minus 1.645. Uh, standard deviations to 1.645 standard deviations. So here we see the 90%, here we see the 95, and here we see the 99%. By multiplying that z-score for any area we're interested in, 90, 90, 95, or 99%, these are the most common, by the standard error of the mean, we arrive at a value that brackets our point estimate of the mean with a range of values that would encompass the true population mean. 90%, 95, or 99% of that time. Knowing this, we can exclude other data from being equivalent to our true population mean, yeah. and knowing this, we can compare two data sets to see if, uh, if they are equivalent or not.